Okay, so uh, we're going to talk about serverless continuous delivery, right? Everybody knows what continuous delivery is. I don't need to explain. Everybody fully automated until all the way until production. The only thing you're doing as developers is commit code, code to Git, right? Simple. 2019, no need to explain. Excellent. So, uh, I'm going to skip. So, before I started, a few minutes ago, I created a, a cluster from scratch. Um, that con in this case, in Google, but everything I'm explaining works anywhere, basically. Whether it's on-prem, whether it's on Amazon, whether it's Google, Azure, does not really matter. Works everywhere. That's one of the very important things. Uh, you should never be locked into any vendor. So that's also clear. So let's start with introduction. This is how it looks look like. My name is Victor. I work for a company called CloudBees. We are a company behind Jenkins and quite a few other products. Um, I'm also working closely with Google a lot. I work with Docker folks a lot. I work with Kubernetes community a lot. So that's kind of my area of interest. Containers, continuous delivery, continuous deployment, microservices, and quite a few other things in between. I have a blog post, everybody does, I have books, I have a Twitter account, and now you know everything about me, and we can talk about the real deal. And the real deal is that, who's using Jenkins here? Excellent. Jenkins does not scale. I don't know if any of you worked in a company, worked in a company with more than 50 people, you cannot scale Jenkins, right? And that's not only Jenkins. I mean, most of your applications cannot be scaled because most of the applications were not designed uh, recently, and those things were not as important before as they were today, right? Uh, so it's not only don't throw stones only at me because Jenkins does not scale. Your applications most likely don't scale either, so don't, uh, don't be so picky. Anyways, uh, by be not being able to scale, that means that uh, it, it cannot be highly available. Right? Because if you have only one instance of something, when that instance goes down, it will come back up, but still you will have seconds, maybe minutes, maybe hours, depends on your application that uh, will be unavailable. And there are many other problems with Jenkins for a simple reason, because Jenkins was designed 15 years ago. Right? It's cool, we all like it, when you are us using it, it's, it is by far the most widely used uh, application of that type in the market, but the age shows. So. Let's talk quickly, before I show you new stuff, uh, let's talk quickly what we're doing today, more or less, some of you. So you have Git repositories. None of you is using CVS, right? And none of you is using SVN. We're on, all on Git. And the logic is very simple. Uh, and the logic is that you push something to Git, and that something initiates a process that does a bunch of stuff. It builds your applications, it tests your applications, it deploys your application, so on and so forth, right? You can have buttons in Jenkins. You're never, you were never supposed to use them, right? You're not. You're okay, cool. Okay, so we push something to Jenkins. Uh, we push something to Git. Git initiates a process in a cluster, and that cluster happens to have Jenkins. Um, and Jenkins, even though I said it does not scale, it kind of does kind of scale in the terms that every time you notify Jenkins that there is something that should be done. Jenkins spins up a new agent, new container. We are all talking about Kubernetes here. We are not talking about whatever existed before Kubernetes. So every, every time you run a build, that creates a new pod. That pod contains containers with uh, all the tools you need. And that somehow scales. But there is still that monster, in this case in green, that cannot be scaled. So sooner or later, depends on your size of your organization, sooner or later, you will have to have multiple Jenkins instances, right? Uh, unless you are maybe a couple of teams, but as soon as you reach maybe 10 teams, uh, you will have to have more. So what do we do? When we need more, we spin up more Jenkinses, right? Uh, we went as far, actually, to suggest every team to have its own Jenkins, because then we avoid quite a few other problems, right? So. You scale Jenkins, you scale Jenkins by creating new instances of Jenkins, which is not the same thing as creating replicas of the same application. That's through scaling. This is not. And nevertheless, you create one Jenkins, two Jenkins, three Jenkins, so, so, so on and so forth. All those are spinning agents, and they're creating them when needed and destroying when not. Now, the problem comes when Jenkins fails, right? What happens when Jenkins fails? Assuming that we are running in Kubernetes, you're running in Kubernetes here, right? What's, what's wrong? Let me check. Is, 
it is 2019. <laughs> so shame on you. <laughs> okay, pretend that you're using Kubernetes, right? And pretend that you know what Kubernetes does. And what Kubernetes does, among many other things, is that when something fails, it will bring that something back up, right? So Kubernetes guarantees that your application will most of the time be running. Still, there is a downtime. Jenkins goes down, Kubernetes brings it back up, and there is a second minute, whatever the period of time is between uh, dying and being reborn, uh, when you have downtime. And downtime is unacceptable, right? Uh, it's a really horrible thing, and we know why, and so on and so forth. So, what we started like uh, maybe 15 months, year and a half ago, is to rewrite Jenkins completely, right? In the current version of Jenkins X, there is no Jenkins. So all, the, all of you who love Jenkins, there is no Jenkins anymore. There is Jenkins name only, it's called now Jenkins X. So what we did is, uh, like many of you are probably facing, we had a monolith and we decided to, that the time has come to um, put it to rest. So we were building up, first we started chopping parts of Jenkins, creating new applications, chopping, 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 until there was nothing left. And now in the current iteration of Jenkins X, there is no Jenkins at all. I mean, there is a name, Jenkins, but then there is a process and so on and so forth, but there is not a single line of Jenkins left. And I think it's a really cool example because we actually managed to get rid of, to rewrite completely application in approximately half a year, maybe a year, uh, something that was being developed for 15 years approximately. So, how does it look like today? Today we have three major components. One is Prow. Prow is a project It started by Kubernetes community and it is their internal tool how they do CI CD in Kubernetes, right? Now many of the things of Prow are not really cool anymore, uh, but some are. And the part that we, have, we are using Prow for, and I will show you later, is all the communication between Git and your cluster, right? And on top of that, I will, sh I will show you as well, we are heavy users with Prow on uh, chat ops, right? So I assume nobody's pressing any buttons anymore and stuff like that, but there is some communication going on. And when you pull, make a pull request, I, I, s I assume that you're writing something. I want to assign it to Pepito, and that is chat ops because that is converted into some actions. You'll see that. So that's the first component. And the second one is Tecton. Now, if you're not, since you're, we already agreed that you're pretending that you're using Kubernetes, uh, you really probably don't know what Tecton is. So Tecton is a way, so actually, let's go back a moment. There is something called Knative. Knative is how we run serverless, most common way, not the only one, but most common way to run serverless loads in Kubernetes. Because to be honest, it makes no sense to me to to run serverless outside of Kubernetes, because if you do that, if you go to Lambda or Azure Functions, then you're locked forever and ever, and you will never get out. Anyways, assuming that you're running Kubernetes, and assuming that you're, you're interested into serverless, you are most likely going to write down right now, check Knative, because it's really cool. Now, spin-off of that project Knative is called Tekton. Again, both of them started with Google, afterwards many companies, including the one I work for, contributed heavily. So, Tecton is the other piece of, uh, of the puzzle, and basically Tecton replaces Jenkins, right? Because it is fully serverless, it allows us to run any size of any load inside of our cluster without really putting a lot of uh, overhead on what we are doing. And the third one is Jenkins X, that's the one I'm gonna show you very soon. Jenkins X basically bundles a bunch of stuff. Prow and, and Tecton that I mentioned before, and quite a few other things, right? It's a bundle of different open source tools plus a lot of custom code uh, that makes, allows me to say that Jenkins is kaput. No more, this is what you should be using from now on. All of, the, all of those of you who like Jenkins, this is the next generation, Jenkins is dead. So, um, I'm gonna try to keep this relatively short because I would like to have more Q&A than uh, it is usual. So I'm gonna go through a quick demo to show you how all that world looks like, comment on a couple of things that I will be doing, and then let's discuss and tell me how terribly I'm wrong about saying that Jenkins is dead. Um, so 
Before I do the demo, this is more or less the architecture of the new solution. This is extremely simplified, right? It's much simpler than it really is. There's much more going on, but uh, if you want a simple version, that's, that's what we're doing right now. Everything is GitOps, meaning that you are pushing things to Git. No more SSH access to your servers because there is no reason Git is the only source of truth and blah, blah, blah. We all know those things. Prow is handling that communication with Git. Pipeline operator translates YAML files that define your pipelines. You will see them soon into, into Tecton because Tecton is very low level. You will hardly ever want to operate it. On, it's designed to be low level. So pipeline operator makes it more humanly uh, useful. So let's take a quick look at how that works. First thing, this is my cluster. This is everything that is running in my cluster. And now it doesn't fit on one screen because there are many things happening there. But I just wanted to make sure that you all understand is that there is no Jenkins there. Try to find it. It's like finding Voldo. I don't know if anybody knows that expression. You will not find it. There is no Jenkins anymore. What is there, if you exclude things like uh, MongoDB and uh, Monocular and a few other things that are mostly registries, places where we store binaries one way or another, the only thing that runs when I'm not running any build is around 50 megabytes big, right? 50 megabytes is supposed to, when idle, when nothing going on, is to, supposed to serve any size of, of loads that I might ever have. So, um, and actually I can show you that CTL top pods. You can actually see that, uh, where is, ah, okay, here are the memory footprints, right? We managed to reduce it, the, the components, ignoring, ignore Jenkins X because those are the registries. They are 8 megs, 8 megs, 8 megs, and then, yeah, everything is 8 megabytes, more or less. Ah, there is one that is 7. Doesn't matter. So, very, very small footprint. It can run on Raspberry Pis if you want to. So, uh, let's start and let me show you how this works. Can you read this? Is this big enough? Are you fine? Cool. Okay. So, one of the things that we really wanted to do, one of the guiding principles, apart from GitOps and ChatOps, is that, and actually my question whether you're using Kubernetes proves that, believe me, you will be using Kubernetes very soon, uh, is that we wanted to make things extremely simple for, ever, simple for everybody, right? So you're supposed to be able to use your Kubernetes cluster and run your pipelines and build and test and deploy all those things without spending seven years learning Kubernetes in details. It takes approximately more time to learn Kubernetes than, than the community is, is spending on building it. That's how complex it is. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to, so I'm starting from scratch, right? I just created a cluster. I'm going to start a new project. And I'm going to do that by executing command. And also, this is another big difference from Jenkins you're used to. This is CLI first, API first, UI comes second, right? I'm not saying that UI is not important, it is, but it is important for managers and CEOs because they like to see pretty colors, right? For everybody else, it's CLI first. I'm not even going to show you UI simply because get used to it, that's how the world works. Today, it's much better, right? So I'm going to start a new project, the first project in this cluster, and you can see the command JX create cluster. JX is a CLI that comes with Jenkins X. Uh, sorry, not cluster, quick start. And I can choose basically almost any language I, I want to code with, right? I can create a quick start in Java, in .NET, in Node.js, whatever. I'm going to choose today Go, simply because I know that this is Java conference and I want to annoy all of you, right? That's my objective here. That's why I'm choosing Go. Uh, and I'm going to name a project JS, JX Serverless, and I'm going to run it in batch mode, which translated to English means don't ask me questions, just do whatever it needs to be done. And that's basically all I'm supposed to do to create a new project from scratch. I have nothing, right? If you already have projects, you could just uh, change your command from JX create quick start to JX import, and then your existing projects would be running and doing the right thing. So what is, what is going on here? First of all, uh, if I imported it, it would detect my language. I would not need even to specify Go or Java or whatever. You just say import my project. It would detect that it is under Java with Maven, with Spring Boot, whatever it is. It would detect everything it needs and do the right thing. 
Uh, after that detection, which is kind of silly when you create a new project, it created a repository for me in GitHub. It already knows who I am, so that it, it didn't ask me any questions. It said, okay, so you're with Farsic in GitHub, and I'm gonna create a project, the one that I highlighted that there in GitHub called JX Serverless. Uh, it created webhooks, uh, which is somewhere that will basically, whenever I push something to Git, it will notify my cluster. So it did everything it needs to do on my laptop, on GitHub, and inside of the cluster. And if I go now inside of the directory that was created for me, here's the one, you will see that uh, it created also a bunch of files, all the files that I might need to work with that project. There is Docker file that, will, that defines how we build container images. There is make file because it's Go. If it would be Java and Maven, it would be, I don't know what Maven does. If it would be Gradle, it would be build.gradle. I think that I know that one. Anyways. It creates owners. Owners is a group of people that are allowed to collaborate with you on a project. You will see that in action, that's a very important part. It created charts. Charts are uh, Kubernetes way of packaging, Helm charts, how we package our applications. So if you're used, with, used to, I don't know, Linux, that would be equivalent to RPMs or uh, YAMs or uh, Debian packages, right? It's a packaging mechanism. If you're all Windows users here, it's equivalent to Chocolate. They told me. Uh, then we have Jenkins X YAML. So again, many of you said that you're used to Jenkins, you use it. This is a completely new format to, uh, to define pipelines. You can use still Jenkins files from before, that's okay. Uh, but better option is Jenkins YAML, I'm gonna show it soon. And a few other files, like Scaffold, for example. Scaffold is a cool new project. Again, not developed by us, contributed, that's, that's true that allows us to define how we build and deploy things in Kubernetes. So let me show you very quickly a few of those files, like Docker file, right? Since it's going small, if it would be some other language, it might be bigger, but anyway, depending on the language and the framework and everything, it creates a Docker file, it creates uh, all the templates for uh, Helm charts that allow us to deploy to, uh, to Kubernetes, it defines scaffold, which is what I said before, defines how to build and deploy. It is abstraction on top of those two things. And the one that matters in this context, uh, Jenkins X YAML. Now, this is cool. This is how your pipelines look like. Now, a single line, build pack, colon, go, right? You can extend it, so don't, don't worry. You can extend this. But instead of copying and pasting Jenkins files all over the place for every project, because most likely many of them are very similar or the same, this basically inherits all the definitions defined somewhere else in a separate repository so that you're focused only on what is different for your project instead of copying and pasting everything, because copying and pasting is evil. And uh, for example, so this build pack Go defines all the steps of the pipeline for Go, in this case, and if you would like to stand it, then you can do something like J JX create step, and then say, okay, I wanna add something to the release pipeline. I wanna, I don't know, build section. I wanna modify build section. I wanna inject a step before, after, or replace existing life cycle. So let's say post, and I'm gonna run a command, uh, echo hello, uh, J, B, C, N, right? And then your new pipeline looks like this, right? It still has all the processes, everything you need to, to work with Go, uh, abstracted from you, and on top of that, you can customize it to do whatever you need to do. Okay. So, while I was talking, I already created the first project in my cluster, and when I was talk while I was talking, a bunch of processes were executed. See the last three, uh, like the last one, for example, master one, that is when I created a project, GitHub notified cluster, and cluster already did everything it needs to do for this new project. And in this case, in this specific case, I configured my, I configured my cluster to automatically deploy every release, push to the master branch, to the staging environment. And I configured it to promote to production manually, right? Again, that can be changed, but you can choose what is deployed, where and when, automatically, and which, what will be promoted uh, 
manually. And similarly, the second last and the third last are the processes that uh, were initiated when that promotion happened. Because one of the horrible things that I think that many of us are still doing is that, you know, you have your pipeline, you define build, test, do this and that, and then deploy somewhere. That's a very bad idea because that means that your deployments are not documented anywhere. If you assume that you, you underst we all understand that Git is the only source of truth, then actually you need to have a repository that defines your environment. This is my staging, this is my production. And when you want to deploy something, you don't just deploy, you modify that repository and that initiates the process that will deploy something. Okay? People complain at the end of the session that I speak too fast and they don't understand the thing, so if you're confused, let me know and I will explain something in more details. Okay, anyways, uh, but what is important for those three is that they run, they did something, and they're completed, they're dead, they're not working anymore. So the moment we finish the process, uh, the pipeline, the build, everything was destroyed, and my cluster continues using around 50, 60 megs in total uh, when idle. So let's take a look at what happened so far. There is a command for everything, so no UI today. I can say get activities, give me the activities of the project code called Sir, JX Serverless, and I want to watch it, meaning that if I was speaking faster, then you would see how it progresses from pending to running to completed. Uh, but so far, you see what happened. Uh, it, uh, it got some credentials from a place. It uh, initiated the tools it needs. It built things. It ran tests. It did. Uh, and it, it ended up with a promotion to the staging environment. That's the part. And actually, you see this promotion, that's yet another pull request. I can show you that one, actually. See, if I show you this pull request, focus only on the highlighted part. It went to repository and said, somebody wants to deploy something to staging. This is the new definition. Accept it, merge it, validate it, and you deploy it at the end. OK. So. Now, let's take a quick look at which applications we have, get applications in our cluster. And there is, there is, there will be only one, right? The new application I created is already running in staging. It is released all one. One pod is running. I did not scale it, at least not yet. And this is the address, auto-generated address through which you can see the application. You can try it out manually if you have to, like, for example, if I just click it, there's your application, right? Running is staging, not production yet. Okay, so now, after you do the first uh, initial creation of the project, what, what would be the next thing you do? And that is most likely that you will pick up, pick one of the features pending from your, I don't know, Jira, whatever you're using, from GitHub issues. Uh, you would pick a new feature and you would start developing it, right? And we're going to do that live here. But before I do that, I'm going to modify the file slightly. Uh, the reason will become apparent soon. So I'm going to tell my, before I start developing a new feature, I'm going to tell, uh, I'm going to create this file owners so that two people can collaborate on this project and I, because I want to show you how it works. One is me and the other one is the other me, right? Uh, if any of you wants to, Send me your GitHub user, I can add you there as well, and then we can do it more interactive. So I added uh, another collaborator to the project, the second me. I'm going to push that. And you already saw what happens when I push something, it will process, build, blah, 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 and it will deploy a new release O2 to production. Uh, what did I, why did I do this? I don't know why did I do this. Okay, yes, 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 there is one more thing I almost forgot. Before I proceed, I will need to add my second me as a collaborator in GitHub. Right? Come on. Until then, let me open my Gmail account because it will soon ask me for... Okay, so I'm going to add another person as collaborator on my project. That's, that's there. Uh, where is my email? Here, this is my second me. 
I have two of everything. And uh, let me very quickly log out as the first me. Come on. It's not my fault that the internet is slow. Any questions while waiting? OK, no more questions. Too late. OK, this is not second me. OK. I'm going to accept the invitation of the first me to become the second me collaborator on the project. Cool. OK. I don't think I need my email anymore. OK, so what do you do as a developer when developing a new feature? You create a new branch. We are all working on feature branches. We are not using long living six months long branches. So I'm going to create a branch, my PR. I'm going to modify the code. I'm going to ma make a mighty modification to the readme, saying, I don't know, I'm lazy. And I'm going to push, add that commit and push it to, to my second branch, right? Just simulating what you would normally do with development. OK, now, so. Once you're finished developing, imagine the time developing, developing, developing. What do I do for next? I'm going to create a pull request, right? That's what you're doing today. Again, there is a command for everything, and one of those commands is JX create pull request. I'm going to create a pull request, my PR. Um, and, and, and there you go. There's my pull request. Now, remember, I am now, I pushed it as my first me, and I'm logged in to GitHub as my second me, right? So what happened here? I created a pull request, and it automatically detected that the first me uh, wants this pull request to be reviewed by somebody. And that somebody happens to be the second me, right? It could be somebody else, but since my owner's file has only two people, then the choice was very easy. If it would be a bigger team, then it would randomly assign your pull request to somebody. Uh, so it asked me to review this, the second me to review it, and it gave me here the list of rules. Kind of this pull request is not re uh, approved. Somebody needs to approve it. So approve it. Somebody needs to review it, and all the other rules. You can change this to, to whatever you want, but you enforce certain certain rules that needs to be followed. So the second me is going to go there. Look at oh, this is a great. This is amazing. Uh, it looks amazing. There you go. There's my code review, right? And um, in the meantime, while I was talking, not only that certain rules are approved, and you can see the commands like approve, approve, cancel, but also uh, my pull request was built and deployed to a temporary environment, right? This is an environment that will exist only for the duration of the pull request. Once the pull request is closed, it will be removed not to waste resources. And this is just in case if you don't have every, all the tests automated, if you want to manually check a pull request, you can do that. And I can do that, like clicking this link. This is the address. I can look at the application. Oh, it looks amazing. This is, this is brilliant. OK, great. So I review the code. Uh, and I can, my second me can proceed and approve it. Right? And you can see, actually, that all the automated automation was ex already executed. You see that it's marked with green checked. So it passed all validations. The tide is the one that monitors my comments and will do something. OK, so what do I do? What can I do? I'm going to show you just a few commands. Uh, this is hor horrible. I'm going to close this pull request because my first me did a horrible job. So I'm not going to, I'm just writing comments, and those comments are translated somehow. And you can see at the very top there that it is closed, right? So we're, we're trying to combine communication with actions instead of having them separate. Or I made a mistake. This does look OK. And then reopen, right? And there you go. It was reopened there. So uh, the most important command that we have is this one. There you go. 
You can, you can choose between kittens, dogs, or unicorns. Actually, like uh, Docker project itself, the open source part, they had the rule, and I already told you that you can make any rules you want. In this case, it is that one person needs to approve it, and that person cannot be the person who created a pull request, it needs to be somewhere else. In Docker community, for example, the approval was two different people need to put a picture of a kitten, and then it's approved. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, LGTM, uh, this looks amazing. You can type whatever you want. What matters is uh, slash commands, LGTM is short for looks good to me. And this pull request looks okay to me, to the second me. And what you will see now is that I got, uh, got the message, you, you need to understand that emails are being sent. Now this pull request is approved, it is approved by this guy. The full list commands can be found on this link. I showed you only a couple of them, and uh, the process is described there. And now what is happening is that yet another pipeline is running, uh, doing whatever needs to be done after we pull, um, uh, approve pull request, and the most important part is that it will merge it to the master, and I already showed you before what happens when you push something to the master, new release will be deployed to staging. Hmm? And now I need to wait until that something happens. Uh, I can actually show you, where is it, activities. See, now the, in this case, right now the promotion to the staging is running and it will be running in staging very soon. If I did keep the tab, it should be release 03, I think. Right. So soon it will be in staging and I can do the last part, right? So my pull request is developed, tested, built, what's or not, approved by somebody. And the only thing missing is to promote it to production. This will be continuous delivery, not continuous deployment. If I would change promotion to production to be automatic, then it would be continuous deployment. Running, running, running. You have approximately one minute for questions. Shoot, be fast. Well, this is happening. Or watch in silence, that's okay as well. No? You're a tough crowd. It's, it's, it's pain. You're all supposed to be chatty. You're supposed to speak even when not asked to. Right? Okay, okay. I see. You're not in a mood today. Is it because European elections? I bet. Anyway, uh, get applications. You can see that, uh, come on, new release, O3 is now running in staging, and I can check it there, I can, I, I can do whatever I want to do in the staging environment. I'm not going to do any of those things. Instead, I'm going to see what is the version O3. I'm going to do the last mile. I'm going to choose, now I'm the third person, and now I'm, you know, the business owner or whatever you call those guys who make decisions for you when to promote something to production. So I'm gonna choose now to promote my release, specific release to production. This will be release 03 of the application uh, JX serverless. So I'm just gonna run JX promote application whatever to version, specific version to the specific environment. In this case, you can see dash dash env production. What it will do is that, that, is that it will make another pull request. It will modify my, there you go. Let me open this link. Okay, it's multi-line, okay, here. See, it created yet another pull request. This is, the, this is not the repository of the application. This is repository that defines my production. And you can see that pull request is relatively straightforward. Ignore, ignore, ignore. The only thing that matters is that it find that my production, among other things, contains now JX serverless application release 003, and that triggered through a webhook a process that will deploy it to production. Right? Everything, everything, everything is recorded in Git, no matter whether that's recorded by us or by somebody else. And now this is running, and you can see that this pull request is still open. No humans involved in this one. Now I need to wait until 
Okay, I had an error. Okay, I don't know why. Uh, I want to ignore the conflicts. I have bloody conflicts. Yeah, I need to be the other me. The first me is the only one who has permissions for the production. So bear with me. I'm going to log out, log in again as the first me. As you can imagine, I did not plan on having conflicts, so, and GitHub is not making it easy for me. Don't you love two-factor authentication? This number is temporary. Don't try it. You will not get far. Eh? Let me tell you that. What was the address? Pool one, I think. Okay. What is the what the heck is the conflict? Nobody knows. I don't see it. I oh, know it doesn't have conflicts. Ah, imagine that it worked. It was supposed to be merged automatically. Live demos always fail. But anyway, it will be running in production in a minute. That's it. I said I'm going to be fast. You have. I'm going to show you that confirm that trains are in production very soon. But until then, you have time for questions. Uh, did I forget something? No. This is my Twitter account. Tell how horrible this was. This is my blog. Buy my books. Uh, don't ignore this. Okay. So, how much time? We have 11 minutes for questions. Yes, please. Yes. Hi. Um, the organization where I work has um, invested a lot of effort making like um, Groovy libraries for for Jenkins file, like a, a, a lot of time. I'm wondering uh, because this looks very promising. Um, can we use this new like I guess this kind of an API? Can you use them for for the your is, shared libraries? Yes, exactly. Can I integrate them or can I integrate this into my my library so I don't have to redo everything? The answer is yes and no. Don't you love those answers? <laughs> okay, so Which one? <laughs> there are two flavors of janky sex. Uh -huh. One is, we call it static janky sex. It's more or less the same thing, but it runs Jenkins from the old, the Jenkins, right? Yeah. And then you can, you, can, uh, you can put into that Jenkins shared libraries or whatever you need, right? And then there is serverless option, which is the one I'm running, doesn't have Jenkins, doesn't have Groovy, shouldn't have Groovy in the first place, <laughs> uh, and uh, and then the answer is no. So yes, okay. you can you can you can use static version of Jenkins sex. It's just uh, I I think that the fl there is an argument saying uh, dash dash tecton or something like that. Anyway, okay. there is an argument to run to do the same thing with static Jenkins and then it would work. It would work. Okay. Now wh where we are going, which I know that many uh, heavy Jenkins users feel annoy, is that we are removing plugins because plugins are evil. Uh, and we are removing uh, Groovy support. Uh, and the reason for that is that you cannot, all those shared libraries, how do you test them? Mm -hmm. You cannot, right? So where we are moving is write your script. Whether that's written in Shell or Groovy or whatever, doesn't matter. You write your script, you tell Jenkins to run it as simple as that because then you can test it in many different ways and so on and so forth. That's where we are right now. But static Jenkins X will do what, what you ask. It will work with your shared libraries. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Let me see whether production is here while waiting for you. Yeah, there is, there is production. There you go. There's one question here. <coughs> yeah, I guess um, there must be some sort of template for the project you have to run, right? Because this one was created with quick start. But if you have something which has not been created with Jenkins X and you want to port it in here, I guess there must be some template you need yeah, to sure. fulfill. So, uh, so the way how quick starts work, let me Google it for you. Jenkins X quick uh, build packs better. Here. So what Jenkins does, so there are two types of build packs are those templates. Uh, 
that I use for a quick start. They're classic and Kubernetes classic would be CI without deployment. Kubernetes would be uh, same as classic plus deployments. Uh, and then you go to PAX and here are all the languages currently supported and combinations currently supported by community. So for example, if you check Go MongoDB, that didn't exist there uh, in the past. I had a need to, I had an application myself that is written in Go and I needed support for MongoDB out of the box and I just added a pack. Now, I understand that I did it by making a pull request to the community maintained repo. I understand that for many of you, you will not do, you're not nice, you will not do pull requests, you will not contribute, kidding. Uh, anyway, you can tell, you can fork this repo uh, into your own private uh, Git uh, repository and you can tell JenkinsX, this is from where you take build packs, right? And uh, then you extend it and write your own, add, do whatever you need, right? Uh, it's just different directories with different templates uh, in there, right? Like, see, those are the same files, just the templates of the same files that I got when a project was created. And another one is, uh, so the demo was with GitLab. Do you, uh, does it work with some other solutions like GitLab, Bitbucket? So on. Oh, yes and no. This isn't the brilliant. Uh, so, static Jenkins X flavor works with any GitHub provider you can imagine. Uh, serverless today works only with GitHub, and the reason for that, there are many components. All of them work with any Git except Prow, because Prow was built by Kubernetes community for their own purposes initially, and they used only GitHub. So, what is happening right now is that there is an open pull request in Prow to support other. Uh, it's actually done by my colleague to support other GitHub. So as soon as that is merged, then uh, other providers will work with serverless as well. Now we're talking about, I cannot commit to dates because we don't have dates where I work, but it's going to be done soon. Anybody else? Nobody? Did I know you so much by saying go all the time? Is that the thing? Huh? Must be. Anybody else? You have six minutes for questions. I spoke too fast. No? Go. Cool. 